And uh, I'm Dr. Alan Blum, and I uh, am the Gerald Leon Wallace uh, Endowed Chair in Family Medicine. I direct the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. And I'm interviewing Ron Bloomberg, the Ron Bloomberg, who I had the good fortune to meet when he sent an email uh, earlier this year uh, wondering if I might have a copy of an advertisement that was published in the Washington Post in 1969 calling for Congress to act on a bill to ban tobacco advertising on the airwaves. And uh, he wrote the advertisement for Action on Smoking and Health um, that was headed by John Banzeff. And uh, I thought this was a, a absolutely a, a needle in a haystack request because I, I was not familiar with the the ad, but uh, using the tobacco industry documents website, uh, I was able to put in enough keywords and play elimination, and it didn't take long to identify this extraordinary advertisement, which was nearly a full-page ad, and we're going to show this along with uh, this interview on our website, and uh, the author of the ad, Ron Bloomberg, turned out to be, this was just the tip of the iceberg of, of who he is and what he has done. And uh, so I get to say I'm, I'm interviewing the real Bloomberg. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, well, and you, sir, for over 40 years have been one of the heroes in the fight against the ravages of tobacco companies, and we thank you for that. But, uh, yes, uh, I... Uh, well, how it started for me was, uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away of lung cancer and wow. she was a big cigarette smoker and uh, that was in the 60s and I wanted to do something to try and do something to go up against the tobacco companies and uh, I I, uh, I saw an article about a fellow named John Banzap III he had just uh, recently graduated Columbia Law School and amazingly, he himself, by himself, this was a man who just graduated college, had a small office, no secretary, no assistant. He took the tobacco companies to the Supreme Court and won. And what he won was, for every four smoking commercials in, in prime time, they had to give up one negative smoking commercial. And that was an amazing decision. And what it was was that for the first time, the American public was hearing about the destruction of the tobacco companies. Uh, quite an amazing feat. The so, destruction that they were wrecking on, on the health of America. Without a doubt. I mean, uh, I think John Banzeff, uh, and later on, we'll, we'll get into it, he took cigarettes off television but um anyhow i i called him i i uh, i read about him and i called him and i told him i'd like to help him and i did somewhat though john called all the shots i was just following his lead and uh and uh, we did good we, we the first year of running these uh, negative uh, cigarette ads telling the public the dangers and horror of cigarette smoking. Uh, we 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 cut well we didn't cut cigarette smoking, but we held it the first year to uh, uh, not uh, less improvement, less positive smokers. So um, that was that. So you actually you actually contacted him right after he won the case. Uh, Correct. Now, it, just to one minor correction, it wasn't the Supreme Court. It was the Federal Communications Commission that he uh, applied to. He graduated law school. He, he sent a petition to uh, demand uh, an application of what was called the Fairness Doctrine, which uh, required uh, broadcasting outlets to air the other side of controversial issues. And uh, this was a, an, an extraordinary um, rule that uh, was in existence for many decades. 
um, because the power of the broadcasting companies was seen as unlimited. And um, it was eliminated by the Reagan administration. And coincidentally, you could argue that that was the era of the rise of the uh, inflammatory talk show hosts, uh, such as Limbaugh, uh, that uh, you, I, I think took advantage of the fact that the broadcasting outlet did not have to air the opposing viewpoint. You are absolutely correct. That, what, is, that is a very important point, uh, as we can see what happened with broadcasting over the over the last 20, 30 years. The, uh, the, the, um, the, the fairness doctrine, uh, well, what, the story that I heard was that Banzef went on a vacation and he got back and he saw a letter in the mail that said from the FCC, yes, we agree with you. We are going to require that the uh, uh, television stations and radio stations broadcast uh, anti-smoking messages. Uh, okay, we agree with you. And he immediately, this is the story, immediately filed an appeal of his own decision in favor to the district federal the federal district court of appeals in the district of columbia uh saying that it wasn't uh, enough in other words he wanted more and the reason he appealed this was according to the story that i heard that he knew that the cigarette companies would immediately appeal the decision to the federal district court in Richmond, Virginia, which was the home of Philip Morris. Mm -hmm. So his appeal actually meant that that case was then heard in a much more favorable uh, courtroom compared to what it would have been held in in the cigarette company's own headquarter town. Well, that's why you're the master of knowing everything about tobacco companies and your research is phenomenal. Well, you know, I, I was I was you know aware of it at the time, but not as involved. I, I actually didn't start a, a John Banzef like organization for another eight years for yeah. physicians, and I met with John. He he was in Miami, and we were introduced by a a, a mutual supporter, someone who had helped me, a guy named Mike Charlin. It was a business person who had been a big benefactor to ash action on smoking and health which was john's group yeah. and john and i met in a it was a vegetarian luncheon place uh, called granny's uh, something or other in miami and it was a i wouldn't call it though a cordial meeting he was so suspicious of who i was and what i wanted to do but uh -huh. he, he i think he finally got the idea that i didn't want to invade his turf i wanted though to enlist the physicians of and medical students of America to do what he was doing with uh, the general public and let, get physicians more active as action on smoking and health was. Um, and we weren't necessarily into legislation. We wanted to ridicule and laugh the tobacco industry out of town. But, uh, but you, when you called uh, John and introduced yourself and said, I'd like to help you, what, what is your background that, that said, you know, I think I can be of help? Well, at that point in time, I had a small agency, uh, advertising agency in Philadelphia. Um, what was that called? That was called Ron Bloomberg Limited. And, and what kind of clients did you have? Oh, I had run-of-the-mill regular clients. Uh, you know, um, I had uh, hotels. I had a spaghetti uh, place. I, 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 you know, just typical retail stores. I wasn't national, I was just local in Philadelphia, but uh, my agency became uh, more involved in social action and public service campaigns that took over my agenda. And uh, so uh, I, I had a, 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 a fair idea of, uh, of what could help uh, in, a, in, in public service advertising. So I, you know, when I met with John, I, I, uh, I, I, I said to him, you know, whatever you need, uh, trying to run some anti-smoking commercials and uh, and giving out uh, information to the public, that's what I did. I, I helped him. I, I uh, you know, again, he called the shots, but I helped him. I think, I think John, frankly. Like you, in a way, is an unsung hero uh, of the country. I mean, I think he saved thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe, of lives. 
with with what he did, giving the public information about, you know, the Surgeon General's report had been out for a few years, but it wasn't breaching the uh, the minds of, of of most Americans, and and it was these anti-smoking commercials that really gave the public uh, the scoop. Yeah, I think it brought. Uh it, it, it filled a vacuum. Uh, the American Medical Association was not uh, getting involved in that issue. In fact, we've done a lot of work on that, and we, we have this on the website, that uh, uh, the, the story is that the AMA did indeed uh, issue a pamphlet on smoking in the early 70s that said, among other things, that uh, if you smoke in bed, that could be very dangerous. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, and they did support separate seating on airlines for smoking and non-smoking, but uh, the AMA was in the pocket of the tobacco industry right up through, in my opinion, uh, the 1990s. They had the same lobbyists in Congress. They, uh, uh, they, you know, they helped each other prevent regulations. Uh, the AMA didn't want Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, the, uh, the tobacco industry didn't want any regulations. So there's a long history of that in. Uh, not a very, not a very positive one, and they they themselves have tried to rewrite history, and we we've tried to uh, keep that original story uh, on the books. But um, John, and you've got the advertising to prove it. You yeah, you have in your file the cigarette ads that they were running back then, where one doctor is recommending this brand over another brand, and uh, you know, and I also remember. Uh, the women's movement, my God, they, 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 their theme was, at one point, um, um, what the heck was it, uh, the tennis... Um, Virginia Slims. You've come a long way, baby. Yeah, and that, that the actual tennis tournament uh, originated in your very town, Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where you're now living. Um, Gladys Hellman was a big tennis promoter in... Uh, Santa Fe, and uh, she had a close friend named Louis Cullman, who was head of Philip Morris, and uh, talked him into being the title sponsor of the first women's professional tennis tour. Now, they could have had any sponsor, uh, but uh, no, the the nine women who who started that uh, professional tour uh, all bought into the notion that their premier product that they would be promoting and wearing the logos of was a cigarette brand, Virginia Slim. So everybody patted each other's back on that one. And Gladys, yeah. Gladys Hellman uh, was, to my mind, uh, you know, a great heroine in the tennis world, but a great villain uh, in the health world. And that's yeah. uh, something that uh, um, the professional sports world still doesn't get. And another villain, vil- villain. <laughs> yeah. villain, as you know, I wrote a play about. Yes. Mary Wells Lawrence, who uh, at a certain point in time, most creative agencies uh, would not take a cigarette account. And we had cigarettes on the run a little bit. And then she came out with a, her agency was uh, Wells Rich Green. And they came out with a campaign uh, called um, A Silly Millie Media Longer. That's just what the public need, a longer cigarette. Right, the Benson and Hedges 101s. Yes, and and to appeal to young women. Uh, and, uh, well, the play I wrote about her uh, tries to examine if she's still around. She's in her 90s. And I wonder if, if, if at any point uh, some of the lives she helps shorten uh, gets into her mind or, or, or because she became enormously successful and was very talented and hurt the tobacco cause a lot. Well, you know, I, I, I was going to sort of save this surprise for, for later in the interview about what you have creatively produced, not that your work with Ash wasn't also among the earliest creative efforts, but you were a screenwriter, a playwright, a playwright, a, 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 a film and TV writer who's worked with Norman Lear and others, and we're going to get into that. But um, I think when I read your play, which you so kindly sent me a copy of, that uh, originally, as I understand it, Shirley MacLaine was going to be in, but when there was a problem with her 
uh, someone saying, no, 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 you can't just do this on stage because that's exhausting. You do it on a film. And you, that was your artistic integrity that said, no, 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 this is a stage play. Well, and, Shirley at one point was interested, but uh, I can't. Uh, that was my uh, guess that she wanted to turn it into a movie, and mm -hmm. I did not want to do that. It's such a great play. All I can say is, I, I don't know, I wished I could be uh, one of your producers on this way, and I will invest in that play if I've given the opportunity, because it's, you, you did something that, with this, it's not revealing anything. This is not just, first of all, the anti-smoking thing is, is an under-theme. It's, it's a current in the play. It's a brilliant current in the play, and it's done, I think, extremely, I don't want to use the word objectively, but it's done so that you're not hitting someone over the head with this. Um, but it's just one of the themes in this extraordinary, it's not a one woman play, but it's, it's nearly that. And, um, what, what I think you've, you've, you've done is, is take the advice of the Godfather, which I take, I took the advice of Marlon Brando and the Godfather when he said, never hate your enemies. It can affect your judgment. And I think you show, if not a, a love of this woman, you show a, a, an admiration begrudgingly, but also an appreciation of her enormous talent. And, and she was cutthroat, but I, I couldn't stop reading this. I read it in one sitting, and I, I, I just want to see it performed. I'll see you on Broadway. All right. <laughs> but but, but is, that not, is that not a fair guess as to how you went about it? I mean, you don't, I, don't, I don't hate the cigarette companies. I can't, well, I mean, I can't yeah. afford to hate them because I don't want to... To, to be blind to what we need to do to get to get, get to circumvent their circumvention of every effort we've tried to, to defeat them with. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, after decades of being a comedy writer, I I realized that uh, there's, I wasn't going to hit them over the head with the message. I was going to entertain them along the way, and hopefully they get the message. What's the title of the play? Um, the title of the play is The Queen of Madison Avenue. Wow. Yeah. I, think it's also, I think it's also appropriate, even though the era is a little post-Mad Men, I think anyone who's familiar with Mad Men would, would really enjoy this play. I happen to have written it before. Mad Men. I, I, I can imagine. And, and even though that takes place in the 50s and this a little later, it's, yeah. it's utterly timely for today. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. What, would you tell us a little bit more about uh, your other? Uh, you call yourself a comedy writer. I think it's it's too simple to say that. But but what other works, for instance, would we uh, want to know about? I, I think you mentioned All in the Family. Yeah. Well, uh, at a certain point, uh, I was uh, in my late thirties, and I realized if uh, if I was going to become a comedy writer, I better start uh, uh, searching that venue. So I I moved my family out to L.A. in uh, the mid-70s. Are you from Philadelphia originally? Yes. And I was there up to that point. And fortunately, uh, very fortunately, the first script I got to write was in All My Family, at the height of All My Family. How did you land that? I, I, when, I, when we went out to L.A., I, I didn't know many people. I, I, I knew a, a fellow. He wasn't a friend. He was like an acquaintance I knew. And he, his name was Charlie Houck, and he, he was a good writer, and he was working on Maud. And I called him when I got out there, and he said, well, send me a scene for Maud, you know, a spec scene, which I did. And they liked it, but they had all their freelancers for the year. So Maud was a Norman Lear show. And, and, and Maud was starring B. Uh, B. Arthur. B. Arthur. Yeah. So Charlie good, uh, was very fortunate for me, sent it over to uh, all my family. And they asked me to come in and pitch uh, story ideas. Um, at the same time, I, I was also running a, a, a sports comedy, uh, co sports commentary uh, syndication across the country called uh, A Voice in a Crowd. And 
some of the writers at, at uh, All in the Family knew my work, and I think they wanted to help me <laughs> try and get a, uh, an episode. I was very fortunate. Wow. I, I, I just want to step back to the sports commentary, which I, I, I didn't realize. Uh, how did you uh, get into that? Well, in Philadelphia, before while I still had the ad agency, I, I created this thing, A Voice in the Crowd, and it was two-minute sports commentary from a fan's point of view, you know, uh, the cost of buying tickets, uh, the cursing in the crowd, you know, anything that was connected from a fan's point of view. Wow. And I got it syndicated uh, over 120 stations across the country, and KFWB in LA was one of them. Um, did you also, ever meet? Did you when you moved out, when you moved to LA? Did you ever meet Jim Murray, the columnist for the LA Times? No, I just read him every day. <laughs> no, I never met him. But interestingly, when I got out there, I had an offer from the CBS TV affiliate out there to do my commentary on television. Wow. And so I did that for about six months until they fired all the freelancers. And me and Joyce Brothers, if you remember. Sure, the, the doctor who uh, was a psychologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, uh, I, so when they fired me, I got a call from Channel 9, the RKO news station. And, I, and the woman uh, news director said to me, we'd like you to come over and do the sports. I said, well, I don't do the sports. I just do commentary. <laughs> and she said, do whatever you want, Ron. Read the scores and come in and do it. Wow. So did, I did. And I didn't love that job, but it lasted about a year. Did, did you? And I got uh, the old family and so forth. But just before we jump off sports, did you meet Vin Scully? No, I did not meet Vin Scully, but I interviewed Walter O'Malley. Wow. And I interviewed Tommy Lasorda, and I interviewed uh, um, Ron Say, and some of the other Dodgers at that point. I just have to add that uh, you're talking to uh, well, the editor uh, and publisher of Dodger Teletype, which I wrote and produced every month uh, throughout high school. Uh, <laughs> I started the Brooklyn Dodger Fan Club. I sorry, the the LA Dodger Fan Club of Brooklyn because I was brokenhearted when they left. I saw the last game that Jackie Robinson ever played at Ebbets Field. Wow! Uh, he wow. made an he made an error, um, and he got booed. Um, he he also then was traded to the Giants. People don't remember that, and he chose not to play, so he retired after the '57 season. Yeah. And um, I um, I started this uh, really actually it was like eighth grade. I uh, did it on an old mimeograph machine. I graduated to a duplicating machine. And I wound up getting, uh, through a little two-line mention in Sport Magazine, uh, about 100 subscribers. And uh, it came to the attention of Bob Hunter, who was the uh, Dodger uh, writer for the LA Herald Examiner and also the Sporting News. And when, I, when they uh, had the Mets in New York, the first year the Mets were there, uh, he uh, contacted me and said, would you like to meet the Dodgers? So I got, actually, this is the, 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 uh, the second year of their existence. I got to go in the new Shea, Shea Stadium on the field and meet uh, Willie Davis and uh, um, uh, Wally Moon and uh, uh, Frank Howard and, and Maury Wills and uh, Walt Alston. And it was really quite an exciting uh, wow. experience. So... We're, I was I was a Dodger fan really right up to when we moved to Houston in the '80s, and my kids adopted the Houston Astros. Wow, wow, that's great! I stayed in touch with Bob Hunter right until he passed away, and uh, we would meet when they would come to Atlanta when I was in med school, and we actually stayed. Uh, I think it was a big part of my life to be a sports uh, fan and root for the Dodgers, and 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 actually get to know them a little bit behind the scenes. I'm going to send you, uh, uh, Grosset and Dunlap, the publishers, called me, and uh, they wanted to do a collection of my commentary, so they put out a paperback book on it. I really I, want to read that. You got to kick out it, because you will know the players. Did, did you, by any chance, ever remember a, a writer called Maury Allen? He was the New York Post uh, Dodger baseball team writer, and uh, when I gave a talk on smoking in Yonkers in the early 1990s, this guy came up to me afterwards and said, can I uh, interview you? And I said, sure. 
uh, he said, I work for the Yonkers paper. I do a little freelance for them. And I, I said, well, I'm sorry, what's your name? He said, Maury Allen. I said, you know, that's funny because there used to be Maury Allen of the New York Post. He says, that's me. And in, in retirement, he was doing this piece for the, the Yonkers uh, Gannett paper. And I said, well, I've got to ask you this question um, that I always wanted to know the answer to. Because uh, um, uh, having covered the Dodgers, I figured he knew this. My father and I went to a, a synagogue uh, around 1960 during the presidential race. And my father said, as all these other kids were asking questions like, what's it like to hit a home run? What's it like to steal home plate? What's it like to catch a, you know, a, a do a, a double play? He said, why don't you ask Jackie Robinson why he endorsed Nixon in the 1960 presidential race? That's true. Well, I never got to ask the question. You know, my hand was up, my hand was up, but he never called on me. And all these years later, 30 years later, uh, Maury Allen says, oh yeah, I could give you the answer to that. It's in our book because he wrote the autobiography of Jackie Robinson. He said during the campaign, everybody wanted Jackie Robinson's endorsement. He was the most important African-American personage in the United States. And he said, and, and um, John Kennedy called him up and said, uh, yeah, tell, tell me about your people. And, and he said, yeah, okay, well, tell me more about your people. And then Richard Nixon called him up and said, would you like to get together? And Nixon and he hit it off because they were both born on the wrong side of the tracks and yeah. they had a great affinity for one another and, and Robinson endorsed Nixon. Now, Robinson later walked out on the Republican uh, convention in 1964 um, when they went hog wild for the pre-Trump uh, Goldwater. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it's believed that today that Goldwater paved the way for Trump because of their extreme right wing views. Yeah. By the way, Mari Allen sounds like one half of a comedy team. Yes, that's true. But uh, either Burns and Allen or, uh, you know, but... Yeah, um, speaking of that, uh, you know, I mentioned to you, I think, a couple of months ago, that uh, I, I'm probably the oldest reader of Sports Illustrated. You know, they have these 12 and 14-year-olds reading them. But boy, smack dab in the middle of the magazine is a big full color ad for lucky strikes or one of the kind of a, a cigarette company that's that's 2021 that's not 1961 exactly i mean it's just amazing to me how how uh, with all the deaths with all the suffering with all the that cigarettes have caused and you know i think i mentioned to you recently that uh, you know, I I, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't know if I want to keep going on asking people not to smoke or getting print ads out. I, I think there should be a, a enormous movement to, to take cigarettes off the marketplace. They, they, they are arsenic, they're rat poison. Well, if it's, if it's ever going to be done, it's going to be through your creative endeavors. But you know something right oh, now, the, the, closest, the, the, the closest thing to this is the, the current movement, I just heard about it the other day, is to ban all combustible tobacco products. And that's been released, ironically enough, isn't this appropriate, that it was released by Ash, uh, really? the wow. same group that John founded, but now it's uh, been in the hands of, a, of another group of folks in Washington. You never hear about them. They primarily work on international issues, but apparently they got 148 organizations to sign on to this effort to ban combustible tobacco, the sale of combustible tobacco products. Well, again, you know, uh, that and, and, and two bucks gets you on the New York subway system. I, I, just, I just don't get the prohibitionistic era. It's, it's almost as if we haven't learned a thing when you see something like this, how easily th that would be circumventable. I mean, at the same time, we're also liberalizing marijuana laws. What kind of message does that send? We're, okay, it's fine to smoke marijuana, but let's ban cigarettes? This, this is insane. It is. It truly is. By the way, um, the ad that I wrote back then in June of 69, which uh, my wife and I paid for, and we didn't have that much money, believe me, but we were so caught up with Dan's ad. And even then, that that was in the thousands of dollars. Yes. And he wanted, you know, when he said to me, Ron, we're going to take cigarettes off television and radio, and there was a vote coming up, 
and my wife and I decided to to do this, to take part of our savings and do it. But I wonder if uh, it doesn't take that long if you want me to read it, because some people may not see. What sure. And, and let me just give a little of the background leading up to that. So you originally contacted John, which I hadn't known about, quite early on in his endeavors. And yeah. then, as you point out, the uh, cigarette sales plateaued. And, and what I understand is that the tobacco companies were the first to realize that because by getting those anti-smoking commercials on the air, even though they were often played at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning... No, uh, they were only played then after we took cigarettes off. But in the beginning... Well, well, well no, actually, you know, the, the fact is, uh, when, when I, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, the, the ads, uh, the counter ads were largely not played in prime time. And when the tobacco, when the, the, the television networks were asked by uh, congressional investigators, well, wait a minute, this wasn't, you weren't supposed to play them at three in the morning. They said, oh, no, that's when you want to get the kids on their way to school. So they actually were not putting these, for the most part, in prime time because they were still getting huge revenue from the tobacco company, but they were going by the letter of the law. If they got to apply the fairness doctrine, okay, fine, they'll put them on the air, but they weren't going to be, um, you know, right next to the cigarette ads in the middle of a football game. So, so, but what happened was, even though they were not extremely well uh, disseminated, uh, the what dissemination they did get made such an impact on sales uh, that only the tobacco industry realized that 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 they themselves made the first move to get off television. They said, they announced that we will, we will voluntarily remove our ads from television, but since there was something called an antitrust violation, why would all of the cigarette companies suddenly wake up one morning and said, okay, in the public interest, we'll get off television? They knew, of course, they were doing it because the, the, the counter ads were beginning to cut into their sales, but they didn't say that. They said, we'll, we'll do this in the interest of, of the controversy, and what they did was one of their uh, members, I think American Tobacco, was not part of that uh, agreement because then they would have been accused of, of antitrust, it, suddenly all a competitive industry agreeing on something. So this had to be voted on by Congress. And Ash was one of the leaders of the effort to, in fact, get the cigarette ads off television. So you could argue really that the cigarette companies were not uh, really opposed to that because it was the broadcasting companies that did not want the cigarette ads to be banned. And folks, only Alan Blum would know those details. You're so amazing. Well, I think I think uh, you know the book Ashes to Ashes uh, brought that out, and others have brought that out, and and the New Yorker uh, writer uh, uh, who wrote about the cigarette advertisements um, in the late '60s uh, was was pointing this out. So. Uh, it's what we forget, though. We, we, we think that, that, you know, people did this and people did that. And what you see today is the American Cancer Society gets away with saying, oh, we got television ads banned. No, everybody says they did. But it really was a combination of ash, of yourself, of, of and, and frankly, of the tobacco companies. And, and another point to make is that before John was able to get those ads on the air, the counter ads, the American Cancer Society did not go along with his petition to the Federal Communications Commission. None of the major health agencies would support him because they were getting a lot of free advertising space, which we call public service ads, uh, that they didn't want to jeopardize because a lot of those public service ads had good mentions of the names of the health organizations, and that was a kind of a fundraising for them. And if you remember a guy named Tony Schwartz, yes. Tony, who created the Lyndon Johnson Daisy Spot ad that was only aired once, but had the nuclear bomb going off, uh, right. you know, and it had the little girl uh, counting the petals of the flowers and then the bomb blowing off. And this was an anti-Goldwater ad. Uh, Tony also created arguably the very first anti-smoking commercial with his own kids uh, dressing up as adults and, and uh, reaching for the mock cigarettes. And, and Tony's uh, voiceover uh, said, uh, do you you know, kids love being adults. Uh, do you have kids? Do, you know, and basically, uh, this was a very subtle way of saying they're going to be just like you. Do you smoke? Yeah. And those ads were American Cancer Society ads. Um, yeah. But Tony's definition of a public service ad was the ads that are on at three o'clock in the morning ta saying don't get, don't take rides with strangers when the only people up that time are not watching with the strangers. <laughs> right. 
Oh, he he was amazing. Yeah, just brilliant. But you're you're leading up to so we've we've got up to your ad now. So this was, I think again, I I wasn't critical of saying this this law shouldn't go through. But I think just as the FDA was given power over tobacco in two thousand and nine because the Democrats said, no, we've got to give tobacco control over to the FDA. Well, Congress uh, wasn't about to let Marlboro be put under the gun of the FDA. They, they grandfathered in Marlboro cigarettes, basically. They haven't touched Marlboro. So that the bill, just like the bill to ban cigarette ads, was full of loopholes. And, and, and we didn't fully appreciate that at the time. But nonetheless, your ad contributed to Congress's decision to vote against permitting cigarette ads to remain on television. Why don't you read that ad? Okay. Um, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all print ad, and uh, the headline is a plea to every member of Congress to take action against cigarette commercials. There is nothing beautiful, funny, romantic, or sophisticated about lung cancer, and that's what cigarette commercials can lead to. Last year, now remember, this is in 1969. Last year, tobacco companies spent $235 million trying to glamorize cigarettes on radio and television. Day and night, your consistent your, your voters of all ages are saturated with the charm of cigarette commercials. Heaven knows people are finding it tough enough to stop, stop smoking. Do they and their families need the enticement to keep smoking? To a great degree, the fate of these Americans is in your hand. The House Commerce Committee has come out with a bill that to even the most casual observer must be termed ludicrous, if not downright biased. They propose a hands-off policy on cigarette commercials for six years. 300,000 Americans die every year from smoking. It is estimated that 4,000 young people start smoking each day in this country, and they propose a six years hands-off policy. There is poison in cigarettes that causes great harm, even death with normal use. Can you think of one food or drug that have known that to contain dangerous components like that would not be whisked off the shelves, let alone be allowed to advertise? Gentlemen, no one at that point, all members of Congress were men. Gentlemen, no one wants to see any unnecessary or unreasonable infringement of the selling of wares in a free enterprise system. But next time you're in your hometown, visit the cancer ward in your local hospital and tell those patients how you voted and why. Brilliant. The, uh, by the way, say constituents three times quickly. I don't think anybody can. Uh, the, the other thing is I think uh, we can't forget that Maureen Newberger, who was the senator from Oregon, I don't know whether she was still in Congress in 69, but she was really the first firebrand in the U.S. Senate to uh, head on confront the tobacco industry. She didn't mince words, and she condemned the American Medical Association for its inaction. So she, she was out there, and there were other women in Congress, um, who, but not, not as notable as she. Um, I'm, I think in the Senate, there may not at that time have been any women members, and I think that would make your ad accurate. The, the, it's just an utterly uh, uh, pioneering ad. I think that it would have to go down in the Hall of Fame of, of, uh, of ads, not just for this issue, but in general. It's really a, a classic. And I cannot think of anything prior to that uh, in print that was in any way, shape, or form uh, comparable. Can you? I don't know. I really don't. I'll be, we'll be looking. Now, there was, of course... Um, uh, uh, George Seldes, who was a, a crusading journalist in the 40s, who published uh, a newspaper, PM, that yeah. uh, really attacked the tobacco industries. But he didn't have to take out ads because he was the editor and publisher. And um, uh, it's a remarkable. We have one volume of his uh, newspaper, and it's, it's just hard to imagine. Uh, he, he was doing front page headlines. This is a daily newspaper in New York. And, you know, every now and then there's a front page headline on the tobacco industry and some corrupt dealing. 
This goes back to the 1940s, and nobody, nobody but nobody was covering this other than him. And then in the 50s, uh, there was a, a fellow uh, named Noor um, who had a newsletter on the tobacco industry, not just uh, tobacco and the dangers of smoking, uh, but the NOR report, uh, N-O-R-R, was, was well ahead of anything the American Cancer Society or other organizations were doing. And his article in the Christian Herald, of all places, was picked up by the Reader's Digest. And that uh, was, led the Reader's Digest to become one of the leading um, magazines that published uh, anti-smoking material. The Atlantic Monthly was another one. But you could almost count on one hand the number of print publications, and print was our major medium through most of the 20th century. I did send to the New York Daily News, to the sports editor, I, I sent uh, a, ad, a small space ad that I wanted to pay for to be printed. <clears throat> the headline was, my kids being hustled in the sports pages. Wow. Uh, and they sent me a letter rejecting it. Was that was Dick Young the editor, or, or just an abrasive columnist? Well, I only know him as a columnist. He was uh, he was really a scoundrel um, in in so many ways. You know, a, a racist, misogynist, uh, horrible uh, character, and uh, he was the dominant voice of the Daily News. Yeah. Well, back then they had some great sports writers. Jimmy Cannon was one of my Right, friends. and Bill Gallo was the cartoonist for the Daily News. Uh, he was the only, he and Willard Mullen did things that nobody remembers. There was a daily sports cartoon in, in several newspapers, and, and Mullins was, was syndicated, and I think Gallo was syndicated. But uh, um, the idea that you'd open up the sports pages and see a, a spoof on something was just terrific. Now you have Tank McNamara, which is great. Um, and, and one or two other sports cartoonists still left, but that was an era where we, we got to laugh a little bit at sports as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that, of course, the, <clears throat> the commentaries I, I made were all satirical. Did you ever, did you ever do an anti-smoking sports commentary? No. That's interesting you mentioned that. Yeah, you know, there really weren't many writers in sports that wrote about it. I, uh, Scott Osler of the L.A. Times uh, did write about our efforts in the 80s when we sponsored the U.S. Boomerang team, and we, we stole the sponsorship away from Philip Morris, and we won the World Boomerang Championship with a no-smoking logo. And um, uh, there was a columnist for the New York Times that wrote about that as well. Um, I'm just blanking on his name, uh, George... Uh, I'll just think about it in a second. But, you know, really, you could count them on one hand, the number of sports writers that even question sports sponsorship by tobacco companies. The, 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 we're doing a, a, an exhibition on auto racing. And to its credit, National Speed Sport News uh, gave me the opportunity to write a guest editorial uh, condemning sports sponsorship by the tobacco companies, auto racing. Um, and, uh, but really, this was, this was no man's land. Nobody was really challenging this. Um, until well into the 1980s and 90s. Yeah, well, they were, I'm assuming most sports writers were heavy smokers back then. Well, and, you know, that's a good point. I, I, I guess that's true. It, you could, you know, they, they, the companies, I'm sure, gave free cigarettes to the, uh, the, the announcers. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the baseball uh, games were sponsored by... Uh, Cigarette companies oh, yeah. right through, uh, really, um, when they were banned from radio. But Red Barber, you know, for the Yankees and the Dodgers, was, uh, would do the cigarette commercials right through. the, the And even Vin Scully with the Dodgers for Lucky Strike. And uh, um, we've got recordings. Even I have one of a Sal Magley no-hitter uh, when he came over to the Dodgers from the New York Giants. And he threw a no-hitter. And... Right up until the end of the game, there you know the, these these cigarette commercials are right intertwined with his no hitter. Wow, wow! But we will. I'll I'll refer you to our 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 um, part of the the website where we t we have this. And one of my prized possessions is a clip from Happy Felton's Knothole Gang. You know, Happy Happy preceded the Dodger games, and they would bring on some little leaguers. And and they would throw a ball at him and, and or they would hit or and they would field and the best little leaguer got to win something. And the clip that I have is when Jackie Robinson did this for the kids and you see them fielding the balls right in front of the lucky strike sign in right field. 
But we will we will continue the dialogue. I hope uh, this sounds like we've just scratched the surface. But you are an amazing individual, and you and your wife deserve to be in the in the Hall of Fame. And I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share this. I just have one other quick question about Philadelphia. I, I, you probably never heard of this fellow. His name was Jack Paller. Uh, but I was in Philly um, just, you know, for a meeting or whatever. And this was 1996. And I happened to see uh, uh, one of the news boxes on the street. And from the distance, it said smokescreen. Tobacco may be evil, but its latest challenger is no hero. And as I got closer, it was for the Philadelphia Forum, a weekly that was free. And I opened it up and I took out a copy. And it was by a guy named Jack Paller. And, and he, he starts this thing by saying, as a former employer of Jeffrey Wigand, I was interested to read in a recent Wall Street Journal that Wigand may be one of the biggest threats cigarette makers have ever faced. On the surface, the reason for this description seems obvious. Wigand, who was fired as research chief at the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation in March 1993, has in the past three months become the tobacco industry's highest ranking defector. That's because he was perceived as a portrayed as a whistleblower on CBS's 60 Minutes. And, and CBS wound up uh, trying to prevent that from airing for a while, and then that story broke, and so they aired this great whistleblowing story how, how Brown and Williamson was putting additives in its cigarettes. Well, it turns out that Jack Paller, who hates smoking, wrote this expose about Wigan because he said, Wigan's a fraud. He's a phony. And he, he worked for me and he practically bankrupted my company. Oh my God. And had Brown and Williamson contacted me, it was a biopharmaceutical company that created many inventions. Uh, he said, had, had, had Brown and Williamson done due diligence and contacted me before hiring him, I would have told him he was a fraud. So it was a very interesting story. I'll make this available, too. But, uh, Jack, uh, I didn't have a chance to meet him, but he was a, a remarkable individual who, who was a very strong anti-smoking advocate, but he couldn't let the Wall Street Journal and 60 Minutes get away with making uh, Wigand a hero uh, because Wigand was always doing a lot of things for his own self-interest and uh, not necessarily to expose the evils of a tobacco company. The Twilight Zone. Yeah, it really is. 